everybody. I am Pamela, she, they, and um, happy Digital Inclusion Week to everybody. We are middle of the week. Um, for those who are new, who have never heard of Digital Inclusion Week before, it's an annual week of awareness, recognition, and celebration of the digital inclusion efforts we've made in our communities. And working at libraries, if you don't know it, you do now, you are doing digital inclusion work. We'll talk more about that later, but um, organizations and individuals across the country host special events and campaigns to promote and increase their digital equity efforts in their communities. And this um, webinar is one of the NDIA events um, that we're doing this week. So, so happy to be here with all of you. All right. So for today's agenda, we're going to start off with just introducing the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, if you haven't heard of us before. And then after that, we'll jump into some key digital inclusion concepts. Um, and then after that, we're gonna focus and jump right into digital inclusion coalitions and ecosystems, understanding how digital inclusion coalitions are formed, how they operate and continue to develop. And we'll also talk about digital inclusion policy. So understanding the library system's role and functions in the, um, uh, state digital equity planning, as well as learning about federal capacity and competitive grant process. After that, we'll have a Q&A segment. So again, if you do have any questions, please put it in the Q&A chat box. All right. So here are the presenters today. I will introduce myself again. Pamela Shive, I am located in Madison, Wisconsin, recently just moved here, um, and I am the training and community engagement manager. I'll pass it over to Paulo. Everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paula Belboa. I'm a senior program manager with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, supporting uh, local efforts in digital inclusion. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, so it's nice to be with uh, some fellow Metro folks uh, above and beyond. I'll pass it over to Amy. Hi, folks. Amy Huffman. I'm the policy director for NDIA, and I'm based in North Carolina in Durham, and I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Awesome. You're going to hear from both of them later. And um, just a brief on NDIA. So what does NDIA stand for? We are the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. And um, we work to advance digital equity by supporting community programs and equipping policymakers to act. We are a nonprofit representing and serving more than 1,400 U.S. affiliates, including 23 tribal entities and organizations in all 50 states, including the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands for affordable broadband, access to devices, and digital skills training and support. Here at NDIA, we facilitate knowledge sharing forums such as our monthly community calls, our working group meetings, as well as our very popular and robust NDIA listserv, find our advocacy efforts with that. All right, so jumping into some key digital inclusion concepts. If you attended the DI 101, this is going to be a nice refresher from two days ago, but if not, um, welcome, and we're going to just cover some basic things. Um, there is the recording link in the chat for you to watch the 101 if you missed it. So first off is digital equity. It is why we're doing the work that we do so that everybody in our community can get online with a high-speed internet, using the internet that they want to with the skills and the, the, the devices um, to do what they need. So they don't have to worry about things like if their internet connection is stable or if they can afford the next month's internet bill or if they um, know how to use their device and navigate the internet safely. Right. With digital equity comes power for all of our community members to engage, participate and change our society for the better. And when we use the word equity, we accurately acknowledge that systemic barriers must be addressed when achieving equ equality for all communities. So doing this means learning the unique needs of our community members. So, for example, learning what popular holidays or religious holidays that exist within our communities, um, having multilingual trainers or trainers that come from that lived experience that we're helping um, our community members with, uh, making sure that our um, space is accessible, um, making sure that our, our space and event is free and at a time that is convenient for the folks we're trying to reach, um, coordinating with community leaders so that we know what's best um, for that community, things like that. 
And then digital inclusion, that is the work, that is how we are going to achieve digital equity for our community. It's those activities that are necessary to achieving digital equity. So it's things like having access to reliable and affordable high-speed internet that doesn't go out when the weather isn't sunny or when it's snowy or there's a storm. Um, having access to affordable and appropriate devices that matches the needs of the user. And also having the digital skills training, and having the digital skills required, and then having access to tech support when there are any questions. And I will pass it over to Paulo to talk more about digital inclusion ecosystems. Thanks, Pamela. So um, NDIA has done the work with our community to create those definitions that Pamela was just describing for digital equity and digital inclusion. So all of the work that we like to do, we like to engage folks on the ground, whether they be practitioners, advocates, or local policymakers, to ask them, what are you doing and how can we best support you? So one of the things that we did a few years ago when we first started was to create those definitions for digital equity and digital inclusion. However, as the community of practice around digital equity continues to grow, uh, as evidenced by so many people being on this webinar today, uh, and digital inclusion we've really taken off, which we're really excited to see, um, we recognize that the work can and should evolve. So last year, we engaged with our community again to define a digital inclusion ecosystem. So I'm going to get to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about coalitions here in a moment, but I want to do some level setting uh, and describe what a digital inclusion ecosystem is and how that impacts our work on a daily basis. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see the definition of a digital inclusion ecosystem that we, again, uh, created collaboratively with our community members. A digital inclusion ecosystem is a combination of programs and policies, both that meet a geographic community's unique and diverse needs. So an ecosystem can be citywide, it can be countywide, it can be regional, in some cases, it can be statewide, um, as we're seeing some statewide coalitions begin to pop up. That's super exciting. But in a digital inclusion ecosystem, these coordinating entities, uh, whether it's folks who deliver actual digital inclusion programming, like a public library or like a senior uh, community center, work with local policymakers in this ecosystem to address all of those aspects of the digital divide. And that goes back to a slide that Pamela showed uh, previously. So those aspects, including affordable broadband, devices, and skills. The intended outcome of a strong digital inclusion ecosystem, one of the intended outcomes rather, can and should be a strong digital inclusion coalition. By sharing resources, coalitions are stronger when the members are working together. So we're trying to reduce that feeling of being siloed or feeling like you're the only person who is really advocating for uh, digital inclusion efforts locally. So under by having a clearly defined mission and structure, uh, participating organizations in a coalition can further their own strategic goals, but also to help and also help build this digital inclusion ecosystem at the same time. So on the next slide, we see some indicators of a strong digital inclusion ecosystem. And we see that this tracks back to, again, those elements of digital inclusion. So a strong ecosystem will have, again, programs and policies that address all of these aspects of digital inclusion. So again, that's uh, affordable uh, broadband, that's appropriate device ownership, uh, digital literacy skills and training, hardware and technical support. And on this last, uh, sub bullet point, I'll just call out digital navigators as a individual program type that holistically uh, is intended to address all of these elements of digital inclusion in the form of one program. So a digital navigator can work with a local community, community member to address any or all of the above uh, bullet points based on the community member's need. An ecosystem, again, is relied heavily, heavily, heavily on collaboration. So entities, organizations, and again, local policymakers providing digital inclusion services uh, should be working together, perhaps under the flagship of a coalition to further uh, their own strategic goals and, uh, and build that strong inclusion ecosystem. We recognize that a lot of the expertise in implementing and delivering digital inclusion programs lies in places like a public library or like a computer center. But in a lot of cases, and, uh, and what we've seen in the last two or three years, is that as our community has grown, as the NDIA community has grown, and there's been more, uh, there's been a, a, 
brighter light shined on the issues of digital equity and digital inclusion, we're seeing a lot of members in our community join us, or maybe we're talking with members of our community, and we're having this conversation over and over again where we're realizing you are doing digital inclusion work, but you might not be describing it as such. So one of the outcomes that we hope, or one of the takeaways that we would hope that folks get out of, uh, for instance, attending a webinar like this, or watching the Digital Inclusion 101 uh, webinar that's in the chat, or even by joining a community, is that you'll have the vocabulary to describe your work under the umbrella of digital equity and digital inclusion. So we like to point to those definitions a lot because when engaging partners and when building the coalition and when building a strong digital inclusion ecosystem, it's gonna be super helpful to be able to describe your work in a way that partner potential partners uh, can understand. So on the next slide, um, we have an example of uh, an out of, of what a digital inclusion ecosystem, uh, inclusion ecosystem looks like. This comes to us from the state of Hawaii, uh, fully recognizing that this is an example at the state level and that not uh, everyone here is working on the state level. Perhaps you're working more locally. And that's totally fine. I still think that there are some key takeaways um, that folks can get out of this graphic. So just some background here. Uh, a few years ago, the Hawaii State Broadband Office sort of took stock of the existing digital inclusion related resources already there within the state. So starting at this top left quadrant, they first recognized that digital equity is a priority and a necessity for residents to communicate with each other and to find opportunities locally. Moving bottom left quadrant down, they knew that they had the physical infrastructure like broadband and public computer centers where folks could access the internet. They knew that they had residents, here I'm in the top right quadrant, they knew that they had the residents, that they had residents who had specific needs around connectivity. So maybe folks needed uh, some help navigating the internet. Maybe they needed help filling out job applications. Maybe they needed help uh, doing online shopping or connecting with family and friends. So whether through the form of digital literacy or device access, the state of Hawaii, they knew that the residents had this need. Then finally, in the bottom right quadrant, uh, they knew that they had a network of advocates and practitioners places like public libraries, community-based organizations that work with those residents and deliver that work daily. They did realize uh, at the state level, and this may resonate with some folks, um, that these this constellation of organizations aren't necessarily talking with each other, which is no one's fault, right? But they weren't, they didn't, maybe they didn't know about other uh, related programs. Maybe they didn't have that network. Maybe they, felt like they were working in a silo. So they put this image together, defining all of those elements, you know, put those elements into quadrants, easily chunkable bits. But as you can see, they went a step further and lined up all of those elements with the actual Hawaiian ecosystem. I think it's really cool that they, uh, that they took the time to make this image matter for Hawaiian residents, but also for potential partners. Again, going back to the idea of building partnerships and further building coalitions. The state of Hawaii took stock of what digital equity looked like at the moment in their state and then made it make sense for the general public. And they use this image frequently when, uh, when describing their work and when engaging with uh, potential partners to sort of build that tent uh, and expand the umbrella of digital equity locally. Uh, so on the next slide, we'll see sort of like a side-by-side -side uh, image here on the left is sort of like the goal. This is made in the same, made, was made at the same time uh, with a graphic on the previous slide. Um, but the state of Hawaii on the left side defined like, this is what we want all residents to have in a, a perfect digital equity ecosystem. And you see a lot of those components track back to those elements of digital inclusion, right? So affordable internet devices, digital literacy, connectivity, but also they included uh, sustainable funding because the big question always is who's going to fund our work? And, uh, you know, for instance, like a, a pilot initiative, which we have seen uh, previously um, in the digital equity world. On the right side, the state of Hawaii was pretty realistic, you know, looking at what the current state of digital equity was uh, at the time that when they made this graphic, was, which was a few years ago. So graphics like these are effective tools to use 
again, when engaging potential partners or for folks thinking of building programs, rolling up into a, into a coalition building. But I want on the next slide to pause for a short activity uh, with folks. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. Uh, the link in the chat is to a Jamboard page. We'd like you to join us in this Jamboard uh, and sort of begin to answer this question that you see on the page. What barriers do you have in accomplishing your digital inclusion work? So I'll get us started. A barrier that I have in accomplishing my digital inclusion work. Uh, and I'll just call out some trends that I'm seeing on the Jamboard so far. Right now, funding is coming up quite a bit. Uh, lack of funding. What else are we seeing here? Lack of funding, time, staff, uh, money, institutional will, language barrier. And then on, on another side of this, we see language barriers, um, mistrust of digital tools, not enough technology instructors. And then I'll sort of begin to bucket another type of barrier that I'm seeing here, which uh, to call out a few, uh, people being open to learning new things, lack of interest and knowledge from the public. I see a lack of knowledge again. Um, I would call out, uh, as I mentioned, some of, sort of those definitions that we were presenting on. So being able to describe digital equity and digital inclusion as elements uh, that are critical to you know, participating in civic life today. So everyone needs an internet connection. And I think framing it that way is a key part to at least getting people in the room because who doesn't want to be connected to the internet, right? So on the next uh, slide here, uh, or on the next page of this Jamboard, where we are asking a follow-up question, what are organizations you've worked with? And maybe, maybe begin by including your own organization. But further think through like, what are organizations that your organization or that you individually has worked with to address those barriers, to help address those barriers? All right. And I'm just doing a little bit of work here to create some buckets here. Just to call out a few, um, at least for me, the way I'm organizing this is like local, regional, or state government. Um, so a state broadband office, a local government IT department is a potential partner. Uh, libraries, of course, getting big, rep rep big representation here. And then I'll just call out at the center bottom of our Jamboard, um, we're starting to see like different types of community-based organizations. So senior centers, health centers, um, schools, I'll put with libraries, sort of an anchor institution. So first of all, thanks everyone for, uh, for engaging with the Jamboard. Uh, we like to use that as an activity, not only to get people engaged and, and you know, thinking about the content, but also to begin thinking about like specifically the next part of our presentation, which is digital inclusion coalitions. So this coalition, this definition of coalitions, uh, similarly to the definition for a digital inclusion ecosystem was created collaboratively with our community. Uh, we went out and asked uh, members of digital inclusion coalitions the uh, same questions we ask other folks when we want to come up with a new model or a new definition. We asked them what they're, what, what they're doing, what's working and what's not working. So we came up with this definition. Uh, digital inclusion coalitions are a collective of organizations that work collaboratively. So again, that word coming back, that work collaboratively to raise funding for digital inclusion programs. So not only do they gather uh, like-minded organizations together, but they actually do something uh, under the banner of a digital inclusion coalition. So they raise funding, uh, they put together programs by getting everyone in the same room to initially at least sort of share what they're working on and thinking through what are what efforts can be aligned. Coalitions help address those issues of time, effort, capacity, some of those barriers that we saw on the first slide of the Jamboard. 
um, that might inhibit holistic programs and policies for communities. The map here uh, that you see on the slide is a map of digital inclusion coalitions that have registered themselves with NDIA through a survey that we administered in January of 2022. So only 18 months later, this map already looks completely different. Digital inclusion and digital equity continue to be uh, these uh, flagship um, efforts that local governments and local organizations are beginning to, to tack on to, to tack on their efforts to because everyone's realizing that uh, residents need to get online but might be uh, be hitting uh, some significant barriers to be able to, to being able to get online. Uh, on the next slide here, uh, we'll see. As far as like who is involved with coalitions, I would track back, and this is going back to that same uh, survey that I that that developed that map that we saw on the, on the previous slide. Uh, we also asked folks who is in your coalition, what types of organizations are typically involved in coalitions. Um, so the top uh, types of organizations that sort of. Uh, we, saw, we started to see trend as far as coalition members were libraries, education and research institutions, housing authorities, senior centers, technology companies. You may begin to, to recognize that a lot of these types of organizations that are already technically involved in what we would say are successful coalitions across the country are those same types of organizations that folks were beginning to list out on the, on the Jamboard page or potential partners. So just to get the juices flowing and thinking through like who are potential partners that folks will engage and uh, we'll talk through some specific examples of successful coalition models across the country uh, that really sort of uh, support that idea that these, are, that these are the right types of organizations to engage. So an example, um, love to represent uh, New York City digital inclusion um, on a national scale. The Bronx Digital Equity Coalition uh, was created at the beginning of the pandemic, but this is not to say that the members of the, organ of the Bronx uh, Digital Equity Coalition were not doing digital equity work before, before the pandemic. So places like the public library, uh, housing and senior centers were already doing this work, but weren't necessarily talking to each other. Under the umbrella of the coalition, however, like I've been saying, you know, these organizations were able to pool their efforts uh, to limit those issues of capacity, to limit those barriers that we saw on the on the first slide of the Jamboard. One of the first efforts that the Bronx Digital Equity Coalition did at the beginning of the pandemic was to distribute uh, 2,000 Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots to students uh, way back in the dark days when everyone was uh, when when students were working from home, and we saw that device access at home was a significant barrier. Just another example to call out, uh, the Y-Zone initiative in Yonkers is an example of a community-based program uh, and a collective of organizations that are working together to connect residents to digital resources. There are many, many models uh, elsewhere across the country. I'll just call out the Cleveland Digital Equity Coalition got together, uh, I think in 2021, to, uh, to gather the resources of the, of the city and county public library, a lot of these uh, familiar players like the housing and, and senior centers, the uh, workforce development department and independent organizations to get together, align efforts, and then begin delivering a Cleveland Digital Navigator program that is specifically tailored to residents of the Cleveland area. So I'll pause there and move on to the next slide and just mention that this part of the webinar we recognize is a lot of information. You can find all of this information and more uh, in the Digital Inclusion Coalition Guidebook, which talks through in detail a lot of the elements that I've sort of just skimmed uh, in, the, in this short part of the presentation. So for more detail around coalition structure, for instance, who does what, right? Like how do you create a set of bylaws? How do you create a mission and vision statement? All of those specifics, we talk through the mechanics of the Coalition Guidebook with a lot of detail that is from, with examples from the field. So me personally, I'm heading up all of our coalition efforts at NDIA. Um, I would love to follow up with anyone on this call who is interested in talking in more detail around coalition building. 
And also one more plug, uh, monthly, the NDIA has a uh, coalition working group every third Thursday of the month in which we get a lot of the experts who, um, who contributed to writing the coalition guidebook. We get them in one room and sort of get a conversation happening. As, a, as, as uh, I would say, it's useful as a place for folks to meet with each other, but also for folks who are new to digital equity to learn um, from some experts in the field. So with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Amy, who will talk about some digital equity policy. Thank you, Paulo, and thank you, Pamela, for inviting me to this webinar today. I'm really excited to talk with you all about digital inclusion policy. So if you all were on our 101 earlier this week, then you heard me talk about um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and how uh, we're living in times that are completely unprecedented in terms of digital inclusion policy, um, which means you are... Uh, knee deep in a lot of work, but also <laughs> this is the most exciting time that I've ever lived through in terms of uh, the digital inclusion and digital equity work. So just a quick reminder, um, and then we'll dig a little deeper into, into each of these today than we did earlier this week. Um, so the, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, there were lots of uh, policies and funds that were included in that act that was passed nearly two years ago, which is crazy. It doesn't seem like two years, but it has been. And um, so there were things, there was money for roads, there was money for airports, uh, money for trains, and money for broadband. So there was $65 billion allocated for broadband programs and digital equity programs. Um, and they're bucketed into different funds and different programs that you can see here on the screen. Um, we're going to dig in deep into the Digital Equity Act primarily today and the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, but I'll just also note that um, while there's no funding set aside for digital discrimination, um, that was Congress telling the Federal Communications Commission that, hey, there is this thing that we're not quite sure how to describe or how to define, but we realize that there is redlining happening in some places across the country and that perhaps it might be a broader issue uh, that is preventing some households, particularly low income or households of color from being online. And we, Congress, would like you, FCC, to figure that out and create some rules around it to make sure that we prevent this from happening in the future. And so that is, that, I just want to name that that process is happening now. And in November, this November, like in a few weeks, <laughs> we will see the commission publish new rules for um, that hopefully will be very strong in preventing uh, digital discrimination from the future. But just keep an eye out for that. Um, and we will notify everyone about that as well. Okay, so back to the Digital Equity Act. So Digital Equity Act um, is a uh, monumental program. It's $2.75 billion uh, to advance digital equity across the country. And in order to do that, Congress created two programs and three grants. The two programs are the State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program and then the Competitive Grant Program. The capacity grant program is essentially block grants to states based on a formula, um, but it's split into two grants. First, a planning grant, and then second, a capacity grant program, which then is basically implementation, right? So states, territories, um, and the District of Columbia are all in the midst of writing their state digital equity plans. And um, sometime first quarter next year, those will be finalized and submitted to uh, the administering agency that's overseeing these, which is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration inside the U.S. Department of Commerce. And once they submit those plans, it, those plans are intended to help states identify, like, how Hawaii had that beautiful ecosystem map, right, to identify what the current digital equity ecosystem and landscape looks like, define what they want it to look like, right? Uh, create a vision for digital equity, figure out what the barriers are to digital equity um, for a lot of different uh, specific populations, 
and then create strategies to close those barriers. And so that's what states are in the process of doing. And once they submit those plans, they will then apply for capacity awards to then go um, implement those plans. And so this is where we are currently and then where we're about to go. So let me just walk you through this timeline. So as I mentioned, states are in the process of uh, finalizing their plans. Many of them are in the public comment period. And I'm actually going to, y'all, Hawaii is just, the I, I'm not going to say the best because that's really unfair, but um, they just continue to knock it out of the park. So here, Hawaii just published their digital equity plan, and they're in what's called the public comment pick phase. And actually, several other states published their plan this week as well. Uh, Kansas, Washington, and perhaps I think Michigan, uh, I don't remember, a couple others, um, looking for public comment. Now, public comment is uh, at least a minimum of 30 days. We encourage you to find your state's plan and comment on it when it goes up for public comment to say, hey, state, yes, you got this right. That's exactly how we would describe um, uh, this barrier for the specific covered population um, or say, no, that's not right at all. And you're missing all of these things, right? Um, so uh, they're in the public comment period phase. And then again, next spring, they will submit their plans uh, or sometime in the in the early first quarter of next year. And then we expect NTIA to open up um, a notice of funding opportunity for the states to then apply for those competitive awards we talked about. Uh, we expect those awards to go out sometime next fall, next fall being 2024. Um, and what we hope to see is that many states will set up grant programs where folks like you can apply for funds to implement your digital inclusion uh, um, strategies and programs. In addition, that set aside that we saw earlier for the competitive awards, that's $1.25 billion. That notice of funding opportunity will open up next fall after the first capacity awards start to go out. And that will be open for organizations like yours to apply directly to um, NTIA to uh, support your programs, your digital inclusion initiatives. Perhaps it's it's funding a position in a coalition or it's helping you uh, start a digital navigators program or launch a digital skills class. All of those would be the types of activities that you could apply directly to NTIA for. And so to, to go back a little bit and talk about the different purposes, I probably already alluded to this a little bit, um, but the capacity grant purpose was to promote the achievement of digital equity, support digital inclusion activities, and build capacity for efforts by states, um, recognizing that states are critical actors within the digital inclusion ecosystem across the country, right, and um, should be participating in supporting the development of a statewide digital equity ecosystem, or, or excuse me, digital inclusion ecosystem across their state. And um, some eligible uses of those funds for the capacity grant um, are to update and maintain that state digital equity plan that we talked about, to implement the plan, um, to award grants to eligible entities, so to make subawards, subgrants, and those eligible entities can assist in the implementation of the plan um, and um, help with digital inclusion activities. And these are the eligible organizations that can apply for both the capacity grants, uh, subawards from states, or and or and or the competitive grant program. Um, so as you can see, it's a very long list of different types of uh, organizations, and. Um, the, for instance, nonprofits <laughs> it includes a lot of different types of organizations, as does community anchor institutions. Um, however, we do expect to see NTIA put maybe some more definition around this to help us have some understanding when they uh, publish their notice of funding opportunity for these programs next year. And then the competitive grant, the purpose of it really is to support the those local efforts to achieve digital equity, to promote digital inclusion activities, and to spur greater adoption of broadband amongst covered populations. 
And the covered populations is this, is that term that Congress came up with to describe the eight specific populations that they want states to to support and also the competitive grantees support. Um, they include folks like veterans, seniors, um, uh, low income households, people of color and um, people in rural areas. And there's a total of eight of those populations. Um, but it's to those it's people who have been, um, who generally are left behind, who are uh, systematically oppressed and disadvantaged. And then just to include, and this is more for you to take home and, and, and study as you're thinking about uh, potentially applying for the competitive awards, these are the eligible uses for those competitive grant program funds, um, things like uh, <laughs> digital inclusion activities that benefit covered populations. That's a really broad bucket, right? So think about um, if you already work with veterans, then what are some of the digital inclusion activities that you already do or could do that could help um, serve their needs more and you could apply to NTI for that type of funding? Um, and then also, this is also a take home slide for you is to help uh, if you want to find out who uh, who to contact in your state and then also how much funding your state is receiving. The, this is the um, uh, instructions and the link. OK, so moving on to the Affordable Connectivity Program, which was also included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It's fourteen point two billion dollars that was um, allocated. Um, the benefit is $30 a month off of your internet service in qualified households um, or $75 off if you live on tribal lands and you are eligible for the program. And then also an additional $100 off uh, of a device. So that's a one-time device program. And uh, eligibility for the program, there's a, a several different types of ways people be can be eligible, but it's um, for folks that are um, 200 percent of the poverty line or less or um, receive uh, SNAP benefits or veterans pension or um, there's a long laundry list of ways that people may be eligible. Uh, the the good news about the program is that it's working. Uh, the bad news about the program is that it's working. So currently there are over 21 million households around the country enrolled in the program. So this is helping your neighbors uh, get online and stay online, right? It's taking um, a, a sizable chunk off of their monthly internet bill, $30. And in addition to that, several providers, um, Verizon, Comcast, many others have actually created a, um, a, a plan that is $30 or less if they didn't already have one. So many households now actually, if they both are eligible for the benefit um, and have access to that provider at their home, uh, they can have service at no cost. So it's very popular. And uh, the funding that Congress included in the Infrastructure Act was a one-time appropriation. So it's for the $14.2 billion, that's a lot of money. And unfortunately it's running out. We, all projections point to sometime by second quarter next year. Uh, so, but likely as early as April. And um, we need a minimum of probably about $7 billion to get us through the end of next year in order. And as you all know, there's a lot of drama in Washington right now over a budget, but we need Congress to act this year, as in by the next two months, in order for folks to not get letters starting in December or January telling them that they'll no longer have access to this benefit. So um, unfortunately, no member of Congress has introduced a bill with funding for the program. And this wasn't included in any of the budget proposals that have been floated around yet. Um, so, but, and in addition to that, we need to fin fill this short-term gap, make sure that we have enough funding to continue the program and from Congress, an appropriation, ideally. And then we also need to find a long-term sustainable solution. We at NDI believe that's most likely reforming the Universal Service Fund. Um, we can talk about that another day. 
but uh, we need a long-term solution that's not coming back to Congress with our hat in hand every year. And so um, the most effective and important thing that all of us can be doing right now is talking to your uh, congressional delegation, your senator, your congressman, your congresswoman, letting them know the impacts of this program, that it impacts real people. So for example, we have a video up on our website now um, and uh, some of our affiliates in Texas are talking about how this program has changed their lives. And we encourage you to do the same. So share your story with your congressional delegation. Um, We've created templates and uh, a letter template and talking points. um, And uh, Pamela just included a link to those in the chat. So encourage you to reach out and share your story. And that's it for me. So I'm going to pass it back to you, Pamela, to close us out. Yes, thank you so much, Amy and Paolo. Um, lastly, if you have if you are not part of NDIA, we really want to help and support your digital inclusion efforts by tapping into our community of over 1,400 affiliates. So if you join as an affiliate or as a friend, those are free and you get access to our monthly community calls where we have guest speakers that share national resources and on the ground strategies for providing that digital inclusion work. Um, you also get access to our popular community listserv, which has over 3000 um, digital inclusion practitioners and it is monitored. Every message is monitored. So it's not just spam coming in. It's all useful information. And then you also have um, access to our monthly newsletter. And I will put the link in the chat on where you can join if you have any questions about that. So um, we want to thank you. This is going to be the Q&A portion. If you do have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A chat. Um, if you have any questions, um, either for me, Paula or Amy, um, here are our emails on the screen. Feel free to reach out. We love to help out and connect you with affiliates or um, help answer your questions in the best way that we can. Thank you all. Thank you to the Metro um, New York Public Library for letting us do this DI 102. And um, happy Digital Inclusion Week, everybody.